Where else can you come and open a sermon with a Pink Floyd song? <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Oh, we've got some Pink Floyd fans in the audience. Excellent. Um, well, good morning and welcome, everybody. My name is Rob Riley. I am the director of Family Ministries, and Ryan, our lead pastor, is on vacation this week, and so, again, you find yourselves stuck with me. Yeah. And thank you. Uh, we'll see if the same applause happens at the end. And we are this morning talking about money. See, there wasn't the same applause there. <laughs> Aha. I was super excited when I found out that I had to come up here and talk about money. Um, there's a little bit of sarcasm in my voice there. I think I saw a few even spouses when Danielle said, we're going to talk about money this morning. I think I saw a few people like, <laughs> you better pay attention. <laughs> Usually it's the person that says that probably needs to pay attention too, right? So... <clears throat> we have been in this series called Elbow Room, where we've been exploring this idea of making space for one another. This idea of margin means learning to say no so that we can say yes. And uh, we've, uh, Ryan identified as we opened last week in this series, this idea that margin is the space between our load and our limits. And uh, he began to talk about how we have this anxiety that comes when our load gets too close to, or exceeds in some cases, our limits. Uh, and last week specifically, we talked about relationships and about how <clears throat> um, kind words are a produce of relationships. And it's through these relationships when we spend time together with the people that we love that we receive kind words. And it's through those kind words that we, uh, that we, that we're, that cheer, which cheers us up and helps to relieve that anxiety that we have. And our anchor verse for this series is uh, found in Proverbs 12, 25, and it says, An anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. So we've been looking at this idea of margin, and specifically we want to focus in on how we provide margin in different areas of our lives so that we can help one another out, for one another, so that we can reach out and impact and love on one another, those around us. <clears throat> And so, today we talk about money. Woohoo! <laughs> Margin in our finances. And so, make no mistake, first of all, let me just set aside right now that what today is not is about how to fix your finances. We couldn't possibly do that in the next 30 minutes. Um, and that's not what this is about. Uh, we have opportunities, and we'll talk about those a little bit later, about how we can work on uh, fixing our finances and making our finances healthy, especially so that we can reach out and help one another. But what we're going to dig into this morning is this idea of why we need to create margin in our finances. Why we need to create margin in our finances. So how many of you have ever wanted to help somebody out but couldn't because your finances were too tight? Lots of hands. Lots of hands. I can think of countless times in which I, there was just somebody or in my life that I wanted to reach out and help out, but couldn't because the finances or resources were too tight. <clears throat> and so I want to talk, uh, kind of wear myself on my sleeve here a little bit and, and be transparent with you. This is an area in which I really felt this week as I delved in, into and, and, and expanded on this topic, I feel very challenged with. I remember, some of you may remember a couple of weeks I talked about my storage unit. <clears throat> yes, and some of you have been so wonderful as to remind me every week. Have you cleaned out the storage unit yet? No, I have not. I have not cleaned out the storage unit yet. But after being asked for about five or six times by people, I decided last week to go to the storage unit. I needed to. My mom is up here, and she has some stuff in the storage unit. We needed to go through that, and we're like, oh dreading this moment of opening up that door, which probably hasn't been open in six months, to discover just piles of stuff in behind that door. <clears throat> um, and we did. So we went there, and we went through the storage unit. We pulled out the stuff that my mom wants to take back to Florida with her and, uh, and, and kind of got it organized so that we could walk through it. Because literally, we opened the door, and there was a wall of stuff 
inside the storage unit. It just literally piled upon stuff upon stuff that we had to kind of get through. So we did go through and we organized it and in such a way so that someday, soon, hopefully, to those of you wonderful people who have been reminding me every single Sunday, did you empty your storage unit, that I am excited that someday soon I will be able to say, yes, I did. But what I discovered when I got there was a lot of my margin <laughs> piled up in that storage unit. And so let me tell you a little story. My family, my wife's family especially, likes to call me the gadget guru. Um, and that's my title because I love all the toys. I've got all of these. are just what I could put my hands on for a couple of minutes before uh, service. This is very cool. This is an old toy. This is a laptop that turns into a tablet. It doesn't work anymore. After today, I'm going to chuck it. But it, yes, it was a ta this was a toy. This is my gadgets. And there's many, many more stuff. This, th this one is very cool. This is a stand for my laptop. The laptop just fits right in here. There's a gadget for that. There's a gadget for everything, right? We have our phones in our pockets and our iPads, and we've got gadgets. And my family likes to call me the gadget guru. My wife likes to identify that need for gadgets and toys as the lack thereof margin in our lives. Because toys cost money, right? <clears throat> That's one of the luxuries that we have, and we'll kind of dig into that in a, in a little bit about what are some of those luxuries that we can identify to create some of the margin. Maybe some of you are working two or three jobs to make ends meet, that you're living check to check. You're in that situation where you're you're just not sure if you're going to make it. How many of you, your, your, your spouse has said to you, oh, I need to go shopping today. And you're like, could it be tomorrow when payday comes? Or you know, can, we, can we make pasta and ramen one more time? Please. <clears throat> How many of you have done that before? I've, I'm just, I, I've had that conversation many times. And so, but we, what we find ourselves in this situation is how can we share another person's burden? And we're going to unpack that idea of what it means to share another's burden. But how can we share another person's burden if you have nothing to share? And so in life, we have these opportunities where we meet people and we encounter people in our lives, friends, coworkers, family members, <clears throat> that we have an opportunity to impact either financially or with our resources to make a difference, to help them out, to carry their help share their burden with them. But unfortunately, we can't because we're living at the end of our rope financially. So if you have your, an ins, there's an insert inside your programs with the talk notes for this morning, and that's our, our first fill in there is we're living at the end of our rope. We can't help out. We can't reach out to those in need around us because we're living at the end of our rope, financially speaking. We have nothing left to use to help ease the burdens of others because of debt, selfish spending, lots and lots of toys, a storage unit, never mind the stuff that's in the storage unit. I think what I could do with the $80 a month, so after the first Sunday I spoke about that, somebody was really kind enough to tell me how much I've spent in the last two years. They did the math for me. That was awesome. <laughs> it's like $2,000 and climbing. What could I have done if I didn't have to pay for that storage unit to hold my margin, to hold my stuff? What kind of an impact? Never mind the stuff that's in there. We were going through stuff, and I was like, oh, this person could use this, and we, well, this person could use Well, that's what my wife was saying. I'm thinking, we can get rid of this with this person and get rid of this with this person and unload it as much as possible. But uh, we have an opportunity there to bless people with the stuff that's in there, with the finances that I'm wasting on that storage unit or the toys that I continue to buy. I don't know that there'll be any guarantee that that will stop, but I can try. <laughs> Um, but we have this, uh, this issue of, of debt and selfish spending that eat away at the margin in our lives so that we can't help each other. And so today I want to draw a direct correlation between our resources that are linked directly to our finances. Okay? Because uh, if our finances aren't in order, then we don't have the resources available. And so today we're going to dig into a story from the Bible about a little boy who had resources available. It's a story we've talked about and you've heard about probably many of you many, many times is the feeding of the 5,000s. But today I want to focus on the little boy in this story who had margin. He came to this, this prepared. He had excess. And I want to, we want to talk and unpack today about how God took that excess, that margin, 
and used it to do something pretty incredible. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, I want to encourage you to open up to the book of John, in chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 5. If you don't, the verse will be up on the screen if you don't have your Bible with you, um, or some of you can unpack your toy, open up your toys and your gadgets, and, and get into the verse as well. Um, <clears throat> but so in John chapter 6, verse 5, Jesus, it starts off with, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. They were looking for Jesus because they wanted to know more about him. They'd heard about the miracles that he was doing and all of the great things, and they were, there was this giant, this great sense of curiosity in them. So turning to Philip, though, Jesus asked, where can we buy bread to feed all of these people? It's interesting there why he asked that question. He, what's also interesting about that is the fact that God <laughs> asked a man, How are we going to feed all of these people? How are we going to buy enough bread to feed all of these people? And it goes on, it says he was testing Philip because he already knew what he was going to do. He already knew. So why in the world would he even ask the question? But it was a tough question at that time. It was a tough question to the disciples of how are we going to feed all of these people? He was testing. And so continuing on, uh, he's, Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. And in an, another translation, it says, it would take a half year's salary just to provide a bite for all of these people. But even if we worked for months, how we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. But then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. And he said, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? So I think that's interesting there, that he, he was willing to identify that there was an issue and try to figure it out, but still was finding himself in this question of like, well, hey, we've got this little boy here. He's got five barley loaves and two fish. But, but what good is that going to do? How many, have you ever found yourself in that situation where you see this tiny little glimmer of hope and you think, well, you know, we've got this, but... There's no way that's going to be enough. How can that possibly make a difference? How can I possibly make a difference? How can I impact that person? How can this little bit help out in any way? But he said he was there. I mean, there was that glimmer of hope. And so we have this little boy that comes with five barley loaves and two fish. Why in the world did he have that? We don't really know. We have no idea why he had the extra bread and the fish. Clearly, it was more than he needed. This little boy wasn't going to consume, well, although if he was one of my little boys, he might, but um, <coughs> they're not so little anymore. Um, I don't think they're in the room anywhere, so that's good. Uh, but it, it, he clearly he wasn't going to consume five loaves of bread and the two fish. He had extra. We have no idea why. Maybe it was shopping day. Maybe it was, maybe it truly was coming prepared. Maybe this was the food for the week. We don't know. But at that moment in time and at that point of need, he had extra. And we have to assume that he had willingness to give of that extra as well. And so in this moment, in this exchange that we have with Jesus and Philip um, and the disciples, we we see a couple of things that kind of come up that I think is important to look at today. And first is we see that there's a need to recognize the burden in others. Okay, The whole point wasn't these people weren't coming to be fed with food. They were coming to see Jesus. But Jesus identified with the disciples that there was this need to to be fed with food, that they weren't going to move beyond, for whatever the reason might be, that that needed to be met first. That physical need needed to be met first before we could even get to the reason behind that. And so we recognize, we need to recognize the burden in others. The second thing is we need to ask the tough questions. Jesus asked Philip, the tough question, how in the world are we going to feed this many people? Seems kind of strange coming from the Son of God. But he asked the question, and and Philip fell right for it, didn't he? He's like, I have no idea. It would have to take us months to save up money and enough to feed. So we asked the tough question. So how do we take that tough question that Jesus asked and kind of put it into life, uh, into today's life? And, and one of the questions that came up in my mind as I thought about this is the question, how you doing? 
How many of you ask that question a lot? How you doing? It's kind of like, hello, it's culture today. How you doing? How you doing? Sometimes, some of you have learned that you don't say how you doing if you don't want to know. You have the, hey, great to see you today. <laughs> um, but we ask that question, how you doing? And, and oftentimes it's, it's just that hello. It's not filled with that deeper meaning. It's not filled with really, I want to know. And I think we receive it that way, right? We hear somebody's, how you doing? Oh, fine. Oh, good. Oh, great. Yep. Uh-huh. How you doing? But there's one word that can change that statement. One word that can take that statement to a whole new level. And it's how you're really doing. It's a different question, isn't it? It's no longer a greeting anymore. How you're really doing. It's interesting, after first service, I had about two or three people come up and tell me just the impact that that one question has made in other people's lives, how the opportunities they've had when they say, how you're really doing, and shared a couple of stories with me about how that one single word changes everything. One woman shared with me about how she asked that of her father who after he had lost his son. And she, just that question, like she'd ask, how you doing, how you doing? Been calling him every day since this tragic event. Oh, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, good. How you really doing? All of a sudden, this explosion of information starts to come out. And relationships start to get, grow and, and change. And, and there's this exchange that becomes powerful, that becomes impactful between those two people. It's a tough question. It's a tough question to ask because you have to be ready to receive the answer, right? You have to be ready to listen. You've got to have the time. So we're going to get to margin and time later in the series. But <clears throat> and it's a tough question to answer because you've got to open yourself up to the how you really doing question. Maybe, maybe it sounds a little bit different because you know something that's going on in somebody's life. And you ask specifically, so how's that situation happening? What's up with that? Where are you at? Ask the tough questions. Because it's through asking those tough questions, that's how you discover what the burden is. You are able to recognize the burden by asking those tough questions. And lastly, one thing that we learned from this little boy, I think that's most important, is to be prepared. He came prepared. We have no idea why he was prepared. But he had the fish and the bread. He was prepared. He was there. So let's continue on and see what happens here. In verse 10, <clears throat> The, the verse continues with, tell everyone, Jesus says, tell everyone to sit down. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered fi about 5,000. And I think it's important. We call this the feeding of the 5,000, which is very inaccurate. Because the men alone were 5,000. Now, there were women and children there, but only the men were counted. And so there's probably 10 or 15,000 people in, a re in the reality of all of this. So <clears throat> he tells them all to sit down on the grassy slopes. The men alone are, are, are at least 5,000. We're probably talking about 10 to 15,000. And in verse 11, he continues, Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. They all ate as much as they wanted. That's amazing. They identified earlier, the disciples identified that it would have taken months just for everyone to have a bite. Months of saving. Months of wages. Just the wages alone. That meant saving up months and months and months of wages that didn't touch anything else. You took your entire salary and didn't pay the bills and didn't buy yourself food. And you just put it into months and months of, then that would have just provided a bite for that 10 to 15,000 people. But yet, we have this little boy who came prepared. We have Jesus that asked the tough question. And he took the loaves and he gave thanks and distributed them to the people and did the same with the fish and they ate as much as they wanted. They didn't all nibble. They were fed. They ate as much as they wanted. And continuing on in verse 12, it goes even further. It says, <clears throat> after everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers. If I were a disciple, I would have been leftovers. There's leftovers? How is that even possible? That would have blown me away. Think about it for a moment. If you were in those shoes. Just the, uh, gather the leftovers. Holy cow. So, so that nothing is wasted. So they did that. They picked up the pieces and they filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves and the two fish. How many baskets did they fill? 
12. How many disciples are there? Hmm. That's interesting. So these disciples, they fed the 5,000, the 10,000, the 15,000 people. They, they reached out to help others before seeking to the help themselves. And God took that little bit, that tiny, inconsequential amount, and fed 10 to 15,000 people, and there was left over to take care of the 12 disciples. I've, I've heard this story hundreds of times. And every time I think about that, it blows my mind. I can't begin to fathom how God can take something so little, so tiny, and turn it into something so great, so amazing. So that it took care of those people and it took care of the disciples. <clears throat> so God takes the impossible and turns it into the miraculous. He takes what seems virtually impossible. Philip was, couldn't believe. He had no idea how this was going to work. How are we going to feed these people? And God took those three loaves of bread, five loaves of bread, and two, two fish and fed so many. God takes that impossible things in our lives and turns them into miraculous things. And so this is, the, this is the clincher. This is the best part of this story is that in verse 14, when the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he's the prophet we have been expecting. What I love about that is what that communicates to us, what that tells us is that creating margin causes people to see God's power. That's the reason that Jesus did it. These people weren't coming because they were hungry for food. They wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to know. But God knew, Jesus knew that by meeting that need in a miraculous way, he could show his power. That was his point. That was the end result. God takes that little bit and helped carry somebody's burden so that they could see his power. That's the impressive part about this. It's, an, it's as awesome as it is that he fed 10 to 15,000 people with all that little food. It's the reason that he did it, was to share God's power. That's the end result. I think that's what we need to focus on when we think about reaching out to share one another's burden. It's not just to help people out, but it's an opportunity to share the gospel, to share God's love in a practical way. I heard that statement many years ago, and, and I just love that, to share God's love in a practical way. There's so many ways that we have opportunity to share God's love. But when you talk about it in a practical way, there's a, it means a whole lot different. We're digging in and we're reaching people and meeting a need by helping to share their burden and carry their burden. Not just to help out. Not just to be humanitarian. Not just to be, not to just check the box and say and feel good about ourselves. But because we want to share God's power. In Galatians 6, 2, it says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. The law of Christ is to love God and love one another. We love God first, and then we love one another. It follows quickly behind there. So if we carry each other's burdens, in this way, by carrying each other's burdens, we are obeying the law of Christ. We are loving God and loving one another. The point for today is margin in finances allows us to bear one another's burdens. When we create that buffer, we're prepared. That's the most important thing that I think that little boy did, is he was prepared. We also have a great example of this um, for Jesus. He sets this example for us in, in hundreds probably of other ways, but in Romans 5, 6, it says, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. The action step there, the action word is that at just the right time. He came at just the right time. Not when it wasn't necessary, not, you know, at just his leisure. It was at the right time. Christ died for us as sinners at just the right time. How many of you have had an encounter where Christ, God has swooped in to help you out through a circumstance at just the right time? Oftentimes through somebody else, Right? Or an answered prayer of some sort. God has swooped in to help you out at just the right time. That's an example to us. It's great. That's like the first step. It's just acknowledging that as our first step in moving forward in our own journey of faith. But God is doing that to set an example because he wants us to do that in the lives of other people around us. 
He wants us to be available at just the right time. And when you make margin, when you create margin in your life, you make yourself available for God to use you at just that right moment. I'll tell you, a couple of years ago, two years ago, <clears throat> my family and I, my wife, we went through a very difficult job transition. My wife lost her job, and associated with that job was our housing. So not only did we lose the salary that was involved in that, but we, we lost our housing and had to move out, which meant that we now had to pay for housing, and we were short a salary. <clears throat> and it was just, it was a very difficult time for many other reasons as well, but from a financial standpoint, it was a challenge for us. And it was through moments in that difficult time where we had opportunities to reach out and help uh, other people, despite the lack of funds or the resources, that God moved in amazing ways in our family. And I'll tell you, there are many times that I didn't. There are many times that I had all those opportunities and panicked, and I didn't answer that call. And it was in those times that I didn't, despite the difficulty that we were in, that I feel like we were, we were challenged most. We struggled the most through that circumstance in those times. And I look back and I see the moments where we stepped in faith to help somebody out, either, whether that was through res with resources or finances. We stepped out, and it was in those moment, moments that I saw my family grow. And we have opportunities like that every day. We have opportunities to reach out to people in our lives to make a difference, to make an impact. By create, but we have to create margin. We have to be prepared. And that's a difficult thing. And, I, and many of us are in these what seem to be impossible situations. That we're in that check-to-check -check mode. We're working two or three jobs to provide for the needs of our families. So how do we create margin in finances? How do we do that? Again, I, we could spend weeks. We could spend weeks talking just about how to fix your finances. Well, conveniently enough, there is an opportunity where you can spend weeks looking at your finances, and it's called Financial Peace University. We have a course here, F F Financial Peace University. How many of you have taken FPU? Say, great, there's lots of hands that are going up. How many of you through that, that, have, that just put your hands up, through that experience of going through Financial Peace University have found opportunities through getting your finances in order to reach out and impact and help out the lives of people around you because you've created some margin. So there's still some hands going up. And I'm sure that some of you, there's still the work has be begun. You don't fix your finances in the 10-week course. You learn the tools, and then it takes a long time to put those things into practice. But how important is it? Because God met us at the time that we needed it. So this is important. This is huge. We need to put this at the front of what we're doing in our lives, in our families. It needs to become a priority to create that margin so that we can be available that's how we share the gospel. It's not about standing out on a street corner with a Bible and screaming verses at people. I know people come to Christ that way. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but that's, that's, not, that's not, I don't believe, what we're called to do. We're called to be an impact in the lives of those around us, to share the gospel. And one of the most important ways that we can do that is to share one another's burdens, to help relieve burdens, not just to help them out, though, you have to remember, and this is, I think, where we forget. This is where we lose out on this opportunity, is we think we're just helping. We're just, oh, I just want to help. I just want to, I want to feel good. I want to help that person out. I want to make sure that they're cared for. And that's all great. There's nothing wrong with that. But the end result, and what you have to keep setting your sight, uh, sight on, is the reason that we need to help out. The reason we need to be available to help people, to care and share one another's burdens, is so that we can show the power of God. So the couple of things are, you know, take, looking at Financial Peace University, maybe working on a budget, you know, taking a look at your budget and discovering where there are, may, all, may already be some finances or some margin that you didn't discover. When my wife and I went to the storage unit, I found plenty of margin that I need to get through. I need to go through it. It's just, it's just another reason. That, this is another thing that God is reminding me through this process that I have to, I have to deal with that. And I'm sure that there are some of you that will continue to remind me on a weekly basis that I need to get out there and I need to deal with that. I need to identify some more margin in my life so that I can make myself available to be there, to help out, to care and share in one another's burden so that I can share the power of God, that I can get an have an opportunity to share God's love in a practical way. You know, <clears throat> it's important to look at this from an individual basis. But we also do this as a church. 
It's, and, and, I, and I believe that, that God has called us as a church as well, or called the church, to answer the call, to answer and share one another's burdens. And we do that in a couple of ways, uh, and we're continuing to expand in that by adding an additional meal. In just a couple of weeks, we'll be opening up on Wednesday nights to have two meals where people in our community could come in here and have a need met. But we're not doing it just because we want to open our doors. We're not doing it because we just want to serve people food and fill their bellies. We're doing it because we want to show the power of God. And through the collective margins of many of you in our church, we've been able to do that. It requires margin. It required sacrifice. It required giving up of something so that we could meet that need. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. We want to continue to grow. We want to do this. We do things like unthinkable. We go out into our community and trunk or treat. And we, we do things because we want to bless our community. And we want to take care of our community. And we want to take care of the people around us. But we do that because we want to share God's love with them. We want to show them the awesome power that can come through just a little bit. You think that just a couple pieces of candy on trunk or treat, eh, you know, what is it? 125,000 pieces? No big deal, Right? People come in, they get their candy. But they have an opportunity to see people when they come through these doors who love them and care about them. And that's just another seed, another glimpse into God's power in their lives. And they get curious. And we have opportunities to do that. So I want to challenge you this morning as we as we kind of wrap up in this this idea of creating margin in our finances. I apologize if you thought, oh, he's gonna solve all my financial problems. We're gonna be in in the plus next week. It doesn't work that way. But I want to give you the reason. I want you to focus on that this week. I want you to spend some time really praying about that and thinking about how do I create margins so that I can share God's power. And I want to challenge us as a church to continue to reach out and love our community. Continue to provide opportunities where we get to show God's love in a practical way. Will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you so much for... Uh, each person that you brought this morning uh, in uh, to Curtis Lake, God, that we have this opportunity to freely worship you, Father, and to praise you for the things that you do in our lives. Uh, Father, we thank you. I thank you so much for this opportunity or this example that we have in the little boy in John that, that brings the loaves of bread and the, the fish. God, what an example that we have there of being prepared and asking the tough question, uh, Father, just uh, we, we pray that as we leave from here this morning that we'll be challenged with that. We would be challenged as families, as individuals, and as a church to continue to seek t- opportunities to ask the tough question about how can we meet the need and care the, carry the burdens of others around us. Father, we do that because we want to show your power. Let that be the end result. Let that be what we set our sights on, that we want to show your power in an awesome way. God, we want to show your love in a practical way in our daily lives and in the life of our church. So God, continue to challenge us. Provide us opportunities to identify the areas in which there's margin in our lives, especially in our finance and our, and our resources. God, we give you all of that, and we give you the resources that we have as a church, and we just pray that you continue to use us as a, as a beacon of light, an opportunity to reach out to those around us in our community. And we thank you for the great examples you have given us in, the, in, in your word of how and why we set, that, set those margins in our lives. So God, we thank you for all of these things, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.